There we go. So today I'm just going to talk about fluorescence, and at the end I'm going to talk about microscale thermophoresis. So first of all, introduce I'm the head of the biophysics facility here at the LMB, and both uh, Chris Johnson and Chris Butters are here as well. So overall, I mean, we've got about over 80 years of experience in the post, you know, postdoc experience. So we've got vast experience. So please come and talk to us. We're here really for giving advice, for training on different instruments if you need that. And for, for things that are a bit more detailed, a bit more, a bit more involved, then you might want to collaborate with us as well. Um, the majority of our work is within the LMB. We've got lots and lots of projects happening. So unfortunately, we don't have very much time for doing any external collaboration, unfortunately. One thing to look out for uh, coming September is we have the next generation symposium, um, which should be very interesting. Right, so what kind of questions do we get asked in, in biophysics? I mean, you know, people come to us and say, you know, let's talk about mass, aggregation, linear binding affinity, um, thermodynamics. And so we've got a lot of different uh, kits. In fact, you know, we're very, very blessed here in the LMB that we've got quite a number of different techniques where we can approach uh, these kind of questions. So today I'm just going to focus on fluorescence, and I'll show you why kind of fluorescence is, is really suitable for lots of different techniques here um, to answer these kind of questions. At the end, I'll talk about the uh, kind of specialties of fluorescence, which is microscale thermophoresis. Right, so to kind of understand why we kind of use fluorescence and you know what what's good for and what are the pitfalls, then we're kind of just going to go through really the phenomenon, the applications, and at the end, like skill from a thesis. So of course, light has got energy. Energy is we're going to be looking at the biological matter, and it's going to in, interpret with the uh, with matter. So you know, light has got got energy here, and depending upon the wavelengths, then that will interact uh, with with light in different ways, causing different, you know, like vibrational transitions. Um, but really, for us, the set occurs in, in in the physical in the profiles here. We get large trans transitions in the outer shell, and it occurs in these harmonic compounds. We get five the five star interactions. And also the lanthanides as well, these keyless as well, if you come across things like alpha screens or lactose screens, you come across geranium and europium. Fluorescence groups, and obviously in proteins, you've got the aromatic groups, um, or in a protein, you could have like a conjugation of, of amino acids and GFP kind of series where you get then a ring system here. And depending on what amino acids have been formed by this, you'll get different properties. And then, of course, there's chemical compounds which you can you can label like electrofluors here. So, what happens in fluorescence? Well, light comes in, and we're going to look at the electronic transitions here in this Jablonski diagram. Here is the different energy levels. Here is, is the ground state at the bottom, and then there's excited states here, excited state one or two. So, light comes in, you get an excitation, and Okay, it may be right up to the upper level, but because, and this will take, you know, you know in very, very, very quick in 10 to minus 15, but this um, upper state may not last for very long just because it's dissipated with its heat and you get down to this upper level here. So these excited states only last a couple of picoseconds. So it's very, very fast um, response. So then what happens is that then this, if this electron then trans uh, goes down to the lower level, to the ground state, then you're going to get an emission of light. And of course, the, the band gap here is much smaller than, than here. The excited state's here, so it's less energy. So therefore, it's going to be longer wavelengths. And so what fluorescence is going to, is going to give out is, is then an interpretation of all this electronic structure here. So what you, you can then get is, if you say you have, if you can hear, you can see your sex an absorption spectrum uh, where you're going to excite the ground state electrons. And here is the emission here. And that's got a longer wavelength. And that's called the Stokes shift after Gabriel Stokes, who did work here in Cambridge. And if you're ever in, in town in Pembroke College, go into the chapel, have a look at the stained glass window, and there's one for Gabriel Stokes from all the work that he did. 
An important thing to remember here as well is if you've got a very, very tight, say, um, absorption admission, it doesn't really matter where you excite at. So if you excite at a shorter wavelength, you're going to still get the same fluorescent spectrum out, but you may not have as much overlap then between the um, emission wavelengths and the uh, sorry, the emission wavelengths and the excitation. That's when they're very, very close together. And so sometimes what goes up doesn't necessarily always come down. So you can have other ways of the energy to be transferred. Uh, one way is fret, we'll come back to it later. Another way is when it gets you know, bleached, non specific, non fluorescent species, or you can get arrangements um, which will lead to phosphorescence. And that tends to be a much longer time scale. So that's why you know, things kind of glow for a long time, those kind of stars and things. So, in how good is the, the fluorescence? We talk about quantum yield. And that's really a kind of a ratio of, of how many um, photons are emitted compared to those that are absorbed. And that depends upon then um, both the, the rate of uh, fluorescence rates and also this rate of non rate of uh, transfer here. And that's, that reflects then you know, dissipation to heat and other kind of processes to the solvent. So, not, not all fluorophores are equally bright. So, why use fluorescence? Well, it's very much sensitive changes in the environment. It's very fast, it's a nanosecond time frame. It's very sensitive. You can go down to pico, picomolar sensitivity. It's very selective if you're just looking at specific groups or GFP. You can have intrinsic uh, groups, obviously, in tyrosines and tryptophans. defense. You can specifically label things. And it's also very reproducible. Right, so let's just have a look at intrinsic protein fluorescence. These are obviously the, the, the fluorescent groups in a protein, give rise right to the absorption. And uh, one kind of trick to, to notice that if you want to kind of just um, excite um, the tryptophans, if you excite 295, then you'll hardly see any, any tyrosine uh, fluorescence. So field anomaly in those ring system doesn't tend to be used for fluorescence because we've got a very, very low quantum yield. And so what happens? Well, it's in, uh, the fluorescence is very sensitive to the environment. So if you imagine then if you had a fluorescence group, say in a very, very hydro hydrophobic environment, say in the center of the protein, and then you start to fold that, it gets exposed to the solvent, then what you see is then you get a change in, oh, that's my pointer. Uh, it'll change in the maximum uh, wavelength, uh, it goes red shifted then. Other factors that, that fluorescence can, can be affected by our temperature, which we'll see later, um, temperature, uh, pH, crunches as well. Used to be a lot of work done on fluorescence crunching um, with like oxygen and iodine and acrylamide. But we're just going to focus on these kind of techniques here today. Okay, to show you how sensitive uh, fluorescence is and how, how well I can report, we're going to go back and look at protein folding with, uh, with uh, these denaturants here. And of course, when you denature a protein, then the fluorescent the groups here get exposed. And in this case, when you add glutamine chloride, you get both a shift in, in the maximum, um, but also you get a big increase in amount of fluorescence emission. So we can just take, say, one, one uh, wavelength here of emission, and we're going to follow this process of, of denaturation as you increase the, the denaturation concentration here. Right, so what you get in this case is it's just this two, two state folding. It's a very, very small, small uh, protein here. So you've either got folded material, unfolded material, and in the center of it, you, you don't have half folded or a quarter folded, you just have folded or unfolded. So we're going to go through some uh, just some maths to actually understand to kind of show you the linkage between fluorescence and thermodynamics. Don't worry about the details. But so here we go. We've got um, an equilibrium here, constant on uh, the unfolded and the unfolded. So if we think about here with the fluorescence, um, how do we measure it? Well, we've got to take into account here there's a linear dependence of the native state fluorescence on the nature concentration. And similarly as well as you unfolded, so just a straight line. 
in the middle, then that for instance is just going to be dependent upon the, the fraction that's folded and the fraction that's unfolded. And of course, that fraction is equal to one. That's related to the binding constant or the equilibrium constant here and here. And of course, the equilibrium constant is equal then to the free energy of unfolding by this equation here. So, um, which we then convert into the exponential function. Right. And way back when, like Tanford kind of showed that there was a linear dependence upon then the free energy um, against the nutrition. And so it, when we, uh, you know, half the protein is folded, we're going to call that G0, uh, D50. So let's just substitute everything in. We can then say, okay, that the, the fluorescence that we get at any point here is transitional and all the way across is then going to be equal to the, the fraction folded, the fraction uh, native, um, which is then going to depend upon then this, just the equilibrium <laughs> constants here. And then if we substitute in, then we get uh, a nice equation here. But the details don't really matter. Essentially, what we can then do is by just measuring the fluorescence here against the nutrient concentration, we can then, um, then find out what the stability of this protein means to unfolding. Why is that going to be useful? Well, if, say, you were looking at single nucleotide polymorphisms, in this case, this is from the Ozaki group, where they're looking at uh, BRCA and trying to understand, you know, uh, all the different polymorphisms. What will they? Or how will they affect? If you've got something that is stabilizing, then um, right, you're going to stabilize the native state compared to the unfolded state, and so it's going to be much, much more difficult to unfold. While if you destabilize the native state, then really then this could become unfolded and unfolded, so a proportion of it will be unfolded. And so for all these range, range of things, they could see that, you know, there's different, some were stabilizing, some were destabilizing. And of course, at uh, body temperature, then this to me and then makes completely unfold and not be able to do its job. Right. So another way of, so instead of looking at, um, Using denaturants to unfold things, we can use uh, temperature. And in this case, then um, we're just going to increase the temperature. But if we say we have something, some small molecules, it could be a ligand, it could be buffer, it could be anything else. And if anything kind of bind on to then the folded, the folded uh, protein, then that's going to shift the equilibrium all the way across. So therefore, that means that it's going to take more temperature to then unfold because you've got both you find additional equilibrium happening here. And we can do this with intrinsic uh, protein fluorescence, then by using Prometheus, it's very, very small scale, it works in capillaries, you can do 40 at a time. Um, it's got very, very uh, large dynamic range, so it depends upon the intrinsic fluorescence of your protein. So some proteins may be fine for fluorescence, you can use a uh, yeah, very, very little, others may, you may need more. You can use membrane proteins, um, and it's, 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 you can also look at aggregation as well by this backscatter. And so what people can, can do in this is then, you know, just screen, um, <clears throat> screen things, but we'll have a look at one of the issues with this. Of course, what happens if you, if you then just take, take an example here, where we're looking at the denaturation, and this went to nutrient, putting the unfolded native, and if we just follow that with temperature of that wavelength there, then the fluorescence goes down. So we can see in, in the absence of, of urea, then we get this transition here. But it's very, very difficult to interpret. So the way that the company has uh, kind of overcome this is to then look at two different wavelengths. Um, and so then you can, you can then compare both the wavelengths, and this is going to take care of the fact that this, uh, the fluorescence is going to go down. So we kind of look at the ratio of this 350 to 350. So you're looking at really the difference in the shape. And so here you can get a much more recognizable transition here. And if you take the first derivative, then you get uh, the maximum and minimum here, that's what would be termed what the melting temperature is. 
and you can screen, say, different buffers or, you know, see what the effect is of, say, putting DMSO into your, into your protein sample um, here. And in this case, we can kind of say that, well, yeah, TRIS is, is maybe okay, PBS is okay, DMSO slightly destabilizes it. You can also look at aggregation uh, because there's backscatter here because the light that shines through, it, then um, it will come back again and will detect it. And if you get lots of aggregation that's going to scatter the light, you find out about, a lot more about that in Chris's talk um, soon. And so here is we have like a purple here is the fluorescence ratio. This is going to go down. And then the backscatter here is black. You can see it, what's happening. It's the transition is happening later. So what's happening is the protein is unfolding and then it's aggregating. Um, and which, if you see it's the first derivative down here at the bottom, you can see this, this here, right? There's the unfolding and then this is aggregation. And of course, that then brings me back to kind of just put a, a big kind of warning sign is that because you're getting aggregation, this folding isn't reversible. So you're not actually looking at an equilibrium. And because you're not looking at an equilibrium, that means that really it's not furnished dynamically, you know, right to say that this is the, the, the melting temperature, because that would, that would need to be something that's going to be folding and unfolding. The aggregation, the stuff is going to aggregate, it's not coming back again. So just be careful. So here's an example in the, of, of using this technique in the James's group. So they had this, um, this capsid protein and they found this pore in the HIV capsid protein here in the center. And right, you can see it here. And it seemed to be in kind of an open and closed. But what was quite interesting was it was quite charged in the center here. So their idea is, well, we could actually block this, this pore by using these substituted hydroxybenzene here. And you can see they could put different um, amounts of, of substituents on here. And then what we did, you could see that here in the end, both is melted here. And as you add more and more, so you added, you know, you know, uh, you know, six, you know, five, six, seven, sorry, six, sorry, and here, then you should be the temperature here. So then this was more able to kind of cross link this four. So not only can you just do uh, fluorescence by, you know, just the changes, you can also look at fluorescence quenching. So this is the case of just looking at link and binding. And in this case, this was a domain that it bound to ATP. There wasn't necessarily any fluorescence groups in the active, active site itself, but what it did, you could, we could see that you actually got fluorescence quenching here, and that this difference in quenching while with nucleotide, you could follow the binding, which we can show, show here. And, so here's a curve we have to correct as well for the inner filter effect. So in this case, we're going to actually measure the binding, find out what the KD is. And this is what was using a non hydrolyzable uh, nucleotide. So in this case, we're going to assume that the amount of complex we formed between the, the protein and the ligand is going to be uh, proportional then to the, uh, the change in fluorescence. And so there's the equilibrium constant, but because then this, we've got very, very small amounts of, of enzyme here at the main, compared to the amount of, of ligand we're going to put in, we can make the assumption that actually the amount of ligand you put in is going to be the same as free ligand in there. So we don't have to really worry about um, kind of changes in that concentration. Uh, but of course, then the, the protein itself, that's going to change. That's going to the concentration of that is going to change because it's then uh, going to be taken up into the complex. So we need to account for that. And under these conditions here, then, as I said, that the, the concentration of the ligand is, is so much you know, more uh, compared to the KD and compared to the amount of protein. We're going to make the assumption here that okay, the complex is, is equivalent to the change in fluorescence. And then when, when we get to the maximum fluorescence here, we get saturation. That's going to be equivalent to the total amount of protein being taken up. Substitute those in to the equation here, and then we get a nice little equation that then just relates the change in the fluorescence against the amount of ligand you put in to give us out the KD. So that's, that's the steady state. 
if we wanted to look at say things in a bit more detail, we wanted to then interpret, well, what is this binding, uh, you know, involve, you know, if, what's the on rate and the off rate, then we need to go to a much shorter time frame. We can do this using stop flow. Again, using fluorescence. And if we, what we have here is we'll have a, say the protein in one syringe, the ligand in another syringe here. They're gonna go through a mixer into a cell and the solution is gonna go all the way through to this stop syringe here. Light's gonna come in from the side. We're gonna look at fluorescence at right angles here. We can also look at absorbance. And then what happens to actually get the time frame is that we're going to drive this pneumatically. So we're going to, under pressure, we're just gonna pump it really fast. That's then gonna push the solution. Let's go back. This is gonna put the solution very, very quickly, drive some of it mixing into the cell, which is a small volume. And it's gonna trigger then this stop to start. And so it'll start to collect. And we can look then in the millisecond time frame. And in this case, I'm gonna look at the observed rate here and then build up. Another way of say of looking using fluorescence is if you could use it as a reporter for an enzyme um, kind of kinetics. In this case, uh, again, it's an ATP is where it's gonna release organic phosphate. So we've got a reporter here, which is a phosphate binding protein. And the phosphate binds there in between these two domains. So when that binds, then the domains change conformation. And so this is uh, Martin Webb, uh, who was down at Mel Hill, developed um, this uh, labeled protein and with command, where he labeled specifically such that when phosphate binds, you've got a huge increase in, in the fluorescence of the reporter group. You could then spectrate that against a known or a concentration of organic phosphate. So then you could use that with an enzyme and measure the change in fluorescence and then calculate that back then to the amount of phosphate. And then again, you can get early time points to, to do the kinetics. Right, so let's look at extrinsic fluorophores. So this is not intrinsic, this is not using uh, natural amino acids. So uh, one way of, of say, of, of looking at, again, um, fluorescence, uh, denaturation with temperature, would be to add in um, something that binds onto the unfolded material. So this is uh, cipro orange. Uh, it, you put it in and, and then it binds onto an unfolded material here. Um, so it excites here at, at, at uh, 495, 492, sorry. And uh, it's uh, 610, and you get a massive increase uh, in fluorescence when it binds onto things. So this is used uh, widely in ligand screening. And the reason for that is because these wavelengths here are, are very compatible then with QP PCR instruments. And you can see then, um, you know, look at differences, say, again, you can look at buffer changes, but a lot of the time it's looking at small molecules. Okay, another way of using fluorescence is to look at changes in mass and, uh, and size and taking, in, taking into account the tumbling of fluorescence groups here. So you can imagine that, you know, if, if say you had a, a, let's say a, a protein that had a GFP reporter binding something big, it's going to kind of tumble much, much slower here. Or if you say you had say a ligand here, this is like dye, so like, like dye you put within or whatever, and it got cleaved, then if you only have one labeled protein, then that's gonna be much smaller. So how are we gonna do that? Well, we can use polarized light. So we're going to excite the site, the, the fluorophore here, uh, with polarized light, the light's shown for polarizer. So the light is only gonna go in one, one direction. So then the fluorescence group needs to get into a specific orientation where its dipole is, is aligned then with the, the polarized light, and it's only then that it's going to press. But imagine this is quite small. It's going to tumble in kind of the nanosecond kind of regime. If you remember from the first bit, fluorescence only lasts for maybe a, a couple of nan nanoseconds. So by the time then it, it emits, then the molecule is then going to be then in a different orientation and then the light emitted is going to be in a different orientation. But what happens if we bind that, that protein or that fluorescence group with something large like a protein? Well, 
the tumbling then time is going to be much, much longer. So by the time the fluorescent script emits, the orientation of the protein is going to be pretty much the same. So the light that comes off is going to be a pretty much in the same orientation as it went in. So imagine we were doing that as a kind of an assay. So you had lots of, say, small molecules. Um, could be like labeled ATP or, or something. They're in solution in a cubet. You're exciting the light here. And everything is pretty much random. They're tumbling very, very uh, randomly. So you're going to get a whole you know, range of different polarizations coming out, coming out. So you could say that then the light has become depolarized. Once you then titrate your protein in, then the tumbling becomes much slower and then the light becomes more polarized. You're getting much more light in, say, one orientation than the other. So the way to measure that in either a plate reader or in a perimeter, by then having a detectors with, uh, with different then polarizers. So this could either be in this, in this kind of T format, where you're looking um, at right angles with a you know, vertical and a vertical polarizer and horizontal polarizer, or you could have a polarizer that just flips between the, the two directions. And so what happens is you, as when you titrate in the binder is that the fraction um, of light that it's got the same orientation, so it's in vertical, going as the incident light goes up. And the stuff that is in the different direction, the horizontal, that goes down. So the anisotropy or the polarization is really just a ratio of the difference between these two intensities of lights over the sum. And you'll see this is more as more common as polarization. But it's important that you use anisotropy when you're doing measurements because that is actually the, uh, the incident light that's actually proportional to the amount of binding. You can see here it's got uh, two times this intensity here. And if you, if you did plot it as polarization uh, compared to anisotropy, you might then get the wrong, wrong result. Perimeters aren't, aren't necessarily perfect. Um, so there's always, you have to then uh, take into account, it might be stray light getting through, the, the gradings aren't exactly perfect. And so this is, again, called a gradient factor, which, which then just um, uh, kind of corrects for that kind of grading error kind of thing. So it's really important that you get a good intensity in the measurements because you're looking at, at essentially at, uh, a, a ratio of a difference over a sum. So if you have too much fluorescent light, it, where it's you can maybe max out the, the photomultiplier, then that might get very, a lot of error. But if you don't have enough light, then the noise may give you kind of some weird, weird results. So sometimes you can even get negative polarization, which doesn't make any sense. And that's because you, know, you don't have enough, enough intensity there. Be very, very careful with uh, using plate readers. Sometimes plate readers will have set polarization um, and you need to calibrate and you need to know what to calibrate against. So you could say if you had some free dye, and we know that that kind of tumbling quite fastly, so that would have a like low polarization. So you can pair that tumbling, which might be like some like five millipolarization units against your label protein, or you can measure it directly in, in, a, in, in a perimeter. Um, also, you know, ensure that you know when you're doing any fluorescence that you know, your buffer isn't isn't contributing to anything. Right. So, which dyes do you actually then choose? Well, not all dyes are the same. Essentially, the the, uh, the polarization that depends upon really, you know, the lifetime of of the fluorophore compared to the tumbling, and which is related by by this ratio here, where then the, the correlation time um, of the protein then depends upon the viscosity of the solution, the volume, the gas constant, the temperature, and this volume then depends upon then the mass of the protein. So if, if we kind of plot everything out here, we can see that if you've only got a, a, a fluorophore that only lasts about a nanosecond, you've only got a limited amount of range of of mass that you can actually look at. And, you know, so if you've got something really, really massive, 
you know, you may just, if you live a lot, that might start up here. You're not going to be able to see very much. You have very much uh, signal here to kind of get reach up to saturation here. So you have to choose them quite carefully to get an appropriate range. So here's um, how we would, we would measure then fluorescence polarization or anisotropy to be um, binding curve. So this is going to be slightly different than the, than the previous one because that the amount of, of the ligand that we've got is, is we're going to be able to small amount, say it's going to be in the nanomolar range. And we're also, a lot of times, in the binding constant is going to be very, very tight as well. So then we can't really um, kind of take into that assumption that, that this free, um, this uh, sort of total amount of protein going in is going to remain, and uh, that's going to be the same as the free, because that's going to be completed. So, like before, we've got, say, um, an initial polarization here, and then we've got an end polarization. And in the middle, then this, this polarization is going to depend upon where we start. And then the difference um, is going to be then dependent upon how much of the, um, the complex we've actually formed compared to the total amount of labeled material. Right, so again, before, Yes, you know, just the equilibrium constant. But in this time, then we have to take into account of both the, uh, the protein um, kind of uh, being depleted and also the ligand being depleted as well. So that gives us a nice um, quadratic, uh, which you can solve. And we just plug, you know, plug that in. As you can see here, this is just the, you know, B minus uh, the square root of B squared minus 4AC over 2A. And then we can fit that. So here's an example from the uh, from Lori Passmore's script. And so they're looking at deadenylation. So this is the, the deadenylation complex here. And so that takes messenger RNA, poly A, um, and degrades all this, that degrades the message. So the question is, so how, how are some transcripts then got a longer lifetime than, than others? It's, you know, how can you get specificity there? Because it's just looking at a poly A tail. So what they find was there is um, accessory proteins here that actually bind upstream of the poly A sequence. And they're specific for different, these specific for different sequences. And, and they will then, because they've got this very low complexity region, they seem to then target then the demodulation complex for their specific sequence. So if they tested these constructs here, this is part three and uh, said said of s and they made then the same poly a at the end and the different sequence targeting sequences here and they labeled the rna with fam and what they could see is when they titrated in so part three it bound specifically to its sequence while the other protein really well it it, it bound as well as it would do if there wasn't any sequencer at all and conversely as well you can see that the ARE kind of bind to its target sequence. So the ZFS bind onto the ARE sequence, while then the PUF3 really you know, binds even worse actually than the poly A. Uh, here's another very, very nice example of kind of the power of using progressive polarization and looking at differences in size. So this was a, a project with David Barford and with Elise Fisher. So in looking at the, the checkpoint assembly, hydraulic checkpoint assembly, um, how that is activated, it involves these proteins here. So it involves um, you know, uh, CC20 um, and the MAD and bump one So they knew that these proteins kind of interact with MAD and the, in this kind of region here, but they weren't sure how that was all happening because you've got two different, you've got two different proteins here. Uh, regions of proteins, but you've got a symmetrical dimer here. So what's what's happening? So could it be that you know it's binding like this, or is it binding you know that like that, or is it kind of mixed? What's actually happening? So the first thing to do was then take labeled uh, the blood peptide, titrate in the mad, and we could see that yep, yeah, we then we could see uh, binding. Here up to the top, 
So what happens then when you then add in the CC20? Well, what was kind of unusual is we saw a further increase. We didn't see any kind of displacement of any of the bug. So that meant that, well, essentially it was an asymmetric complex. And just to prove that that was actually happening, we did it the other way as well, where we have then a preform a complex. Um, and I'm oh, sorry, you, you basically then have the, have the bud, preform a complex with the CDC 20, and then you can see you get then a, a very similar endpoint then in polarization. So you're getting the same, the same mass. Another way of using fluorescent polarization is, is doing, you can do high throughput screens. We'll probably talk about this later on. There'll be some representatives from ASET talking about screening um, on, but here's one that, that I did in collaboration, um, where essentially you can, you have a, a reporter that binds onto an enzyme and you get an increase in, in polarization when that binds. And so in three or four well plates, essentially you can, if you screen a library, you can look at positions where you don't then get, a, get an increase in polarization because, or you get a decrease in polarization because the, um, the small molecule is then displaced uh, the ligand died. So a very a nice way of, of uh, alternatively using fluorescence is by doing, using it to measure distances. So as I said earlier on, um, there's other ways for the energy of the fluorescence to then gene kind of be transferred. One of them is if you've got uh, two fluorescence groups very, very close together, you can then get um, where excited electron in what would be termed the donor, then you don't get fluorescence, you get this energy transferred to an acceptor, which then gets stimulated and then it then gives off the fluorescence here. And this is due to the dipole-dipole interactions between these two fluorophores. Right, and this is called, this is called Fruister resonance uh, energy transfer. You might also hear called fluorescence, fluorescence energy transfer threat. So the amount, of, the amount of efficiency of that is really dependent on the amount of quanta that are transferred to the acceptor over the ones that are absorbed by the, the donor. And that depends to, on the rate of the transfer and also then uh, the inverse of the time for, for the, uh, the electron to be excited in the donor. And then that is simply then a ratio of one minus then the presence in the, in the presence of the donor and acceptor over just the presence of the donor. Not all fluorophores that come together will be able to do that. What you actually need to do is to have an overlap between the public spectrum here of Cy3 and Cy5 you have to have an overlap in the excite, in the emission spectra of the donor, which overlaps then with the excitation spectrum of the acceptor here. So why it's used for distance measurements is that this transfer is really dependent on the distance between the two. So, um, so if you kind of have them very, very close together, you get lots of efficiency, then you move them apart, then there's kind of a sharp decrease here over this wavelength here. And this is then dependent upon you know, the distance of the part of six, and it's dependent on this uh, Foster uh, issue here. And that's where they get just 50% of uh, energy transfer here. So different, Fluorophores have got different R naughts, and that depends upon kind of the then the orientation, the, the refractive index, the coupling, and the quantum yield. But typically, then it's, it's really between you know twenty to seventy Armstrongs. And so, what you could do with it is, well, we can measure distance with, within a, within a complex, or you could look at binding, or you can look at conformational change. Of course, the spectrum themselves are going to be a bit messy because not only are you going to get, when you excite the donor, you're going to get the donor um, emission. And if you get the threat, you're going to have then the acceptor emission as well. So how, how do we calculate you know, what the threat is? We can do it two ways. Can we go from the donor fluorescence change or the acceptor fluorescence change? So let's just first look at the, the, uh, the donor. 
So we need a control, which would be then just a donor by itself, because we need to know, well, how much energy do we get out if we didn't have the acceptor there? So you need to make that two molecules uh, where you've got donor and acceptor, and also then the donor by itself. And then the efficiency is then just going to be the, this ratio here of the presence in the, in the presence of the donor and just and to, uh, presence of the donor and acceptor, and then just with the donor. And then it's going to be one over then the amount of label sites that you've actually got. If we do it from the acceptor, then that's going to be a bit more involved because often you'll find that that the acceptor has got a very very long has got a long tail of its uh, recent submission such that it will um, you need to take account of that in the absence of uh, of the donor and also then you might sometimes then get a little bit of fluorescence um, at the acceptor when you when you excite at the donor uh, excitation even in its absence, but it's usually very, very little. So then the, the calculation here is then that the efficiency then is really dependent upon then the ratio of the signal coefficient of the acceptor when you excite at the donor um, excitation wavelength and the extinction coefficient of the donor when you um, excite at the donor um, excitation. And then the presence of the acceptor in the presence of the donor and the um, presence of the acceptor and then minus one. And then again, depending upon how much you've actually got labeled. So here's an example uh, from the Chin Group, which was a really very, very neat example of how they can induce non amino acids to specifically readable um, proteins. So the, here's a little test with these carbotulin. They put two unnatural amino acids here at these positions here. And these were then reacted to two different dyes. So that you got fed between these, these dyes. And so you show that by then if you uh, put, put the commodity into different nutrients, you have unfolding. And as it unfolded, then the donor, actually the acceptor for essence, went down because fat was decreasing. And consequently, the presence of the, accept, of the donor increased. So that was saying it's expanding and increasing. So we've got um, you know, lots of different uh, types of perimeter and plate readers. So um, a good thing about um, you see the, 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 the things is that oh, God, you need a lot more sample than for, for the perimeter, but it's got much better control in terms of, of uh, temperature and flexibility in terms of monochromators. When we got uh, plate readers, of course, you can put that in your multiplex and you're going to use very, very small volumes. It's very, very sensitive, um, but we are a bit limited because it's got optical modules, so you have to choose what the excitation and emission is. Right, so practical tips, good signals, good data. So you want to make sure that you're not going to have, you're, you're looking at fluorescence and not light scattering. Um, you make sure you're not getting aggregation, make sure it's clean, you know, is your concentrations accurate? When you're working at very, very low concentrations, say in the nanomolar, you might get some sticking. So sticking, I'll say, something that's labeled to your pipettes or the tube. So sometimes it's, it's quite good to put a bit of detergent in there. In terms of experimental controls, you need a good signal. You need to have the right settings, as I kind of said about the, the get rid of an FP. Or, you know, are you, are you excited for too long? Are you getting photo bleaching? Um, don't have time to talk about, the, say, the inner filter effect. Background fluorescence can be an issue. You're kind of thinking, oh, well, you know, my buffer doesn't, it doesn't have any fluorophores in it, but you may get some background from that and uh, make sure you've got accurate titrations. When you're doing extrinsic labeling, you know, you're putting a big presence, hydrophobic group, just make sure that, you know, you're not getting binding to that group and not, say, the reporter that you want to actually measure. You can check that by just by doing placement, displacement. So you say you've got, say, ATP, you know, double with month, and you're getting binding. Well, you could displace that from your protein then, which is not labeled ATP or something else. Make sure you've got good temperature control. For instance, can change the temperature, so make sure that's good. Um, make sure you've reached equilibrium. Um, but we'll talk about this all in, in the data fitting. So in the last kind of 
few minutes, I'll just go through uh, this kind of novel technique, which is microscale pharmaphoresis. Okay, so we've got this uh, this new instrument. Uh, it's been updated again. It's it's like the Prometheus. It's got um, it works in, in capillaries, which we can assign to the instruments. So what's pharmaphoresis? We all know what electrophoresis is. That's essentially movement under uh, charge difference. Pharmaphoresis is a movement in a gradient um, of heat. So and that can depend upon the uh, the charge. Sorry, uh, size and hydration shell, uh, both positive and negative pharmaphoresis. Um, so in positive, then it's, it's kind of moving away from the heated um, area. In negative, then it's moving towards. Oh, there we go. Okay, that's, that's positive. And if we think about this one here, it's going to be negative. So we're going to heat a spot about here. So Stefan Durbin is, in, his, in his PhD then uh, kind of looked at the physics of this and could then sh show that the, the presence movement then was this kind of partition function then it's really dependent upon the size of the hydration shell and the effective charge. So in practice, what you do is you've got your, your, your solutions in capillaries. We're gonna shine um, a presence like down here um, to look at uh, the process molecules. And we're also going to shine at the center an IR laser, which is going to heat the center spot here. And so because it's 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 then doing a very, very small uh, sample, a small spot here. So the temperature gradient is quite is quite high. We can use two different uh, fluorophores. We can use number four in it um, in the green or in the red, six four three. And we've got various uh, kits to kind of then label either for imine or cysteine or hexahistoreactive dye. So what does what does the data actually look like? Well, you have the initial kind of fluorescence here before initial state. Uh, you turn on the IR laser, you get a, a temperature jump in the fluorescence, and then you get thermophoretic movement away uh, until then you kind of turn off the IR laser and then you get diffusion back into the space. So if you imagine if in our bleach of capillaries here, we had the same concentration of the labeled material, uh, but then we increased the binding partner, which is unlabeled. What would we see? Well, because we're going to get changes in size or, or charge, then you get differences in the thermophoretic movement. And we can then look here uh, at this part, look at the changes in, in the fluorescence, and then we can fit that then to the, to the equations like before. Alternatively, um, which tends to be a bit more common with this kind of data, is actually just looking at the, the initial temperature jump um, here. And this is fitted with this protocol called Palmist. And this is then termed a temperature related intensity change. And essentially, that's an approximity effect. So we know from before from the Prometheus that you know, when you change temperature, then you get a decrease in the fluorescence. But what could be happening is, you know, if, if say, um, the a, a label, or say a protein or whatever binds, and you may change the environment um, around the fluorophore, or if you say you get a conformational change, then that can then affect what this temperature related intensity change looks like and then fit the data. So the nice thing about it is the charge uh, compatible. Again, this, this is a very, very similar equation down here at the bottom. Uh, we saw four for the process polarization. And again, this is a con where the con constant here is, this is the concentration of the labeled material. Though you have to label one of the components, it's, it's really uh, applicable to kind of anything you can kind of think of uh, could possibly work. And here's an example then from the Hedgeter group where they had um, then this complex, the EMC complex, and this is a cryo OEM, and obviously it was very quite difficult. You know, I mean, the the resolution isn't isn't tops, um, but they could see that you know they, they knew that there would seem to be this this complex as the EC nine, EC two. So of course the question was, well, is this real or is this not real? Um, and so they could then it was uh, John O'Donnell. Then he labelled one of the components, 
uh, the EC9, and you can then follow the binding. Um, so you, you label EC2, and then you could uh, follow the binding, and you did it everywhere as well. Okay, so practical tips for MST is labeling. You need to label one to one or less than one to one. Um, you know, make sure that when you, you do a calculation to, to see how much labeling you've got, you corrected for the absorbance of the fluorophore at 280. Again, buffers need to be good. Uh, you need to you know, calculate binding constants, you need accurate titrations, so accurate concentrations. One, I mean, one nice thing about the using it in terms of the instrument is the software itself has got lots of pre-tests. So you can kind of show that, you know, well, is it going to work or is it not going to work? Um, so one thing could be that you can, you can just go, right, okay, I'll do capillary scans, make sure there's no sticking to the capillaries, and I'll do initial kind of tests, say, oh, okay, that looks, that looks pretty stable, that looks good. You know, as opposed to here, if you kind of get absorption onto the surface of the capillary, so after time, you kind of get these, these little hats formed where essentially you've, you've lost fluorescence because it's binding. And there's various ways of maybe kind of coming across that with, with uh, you know, detergent or BSA. You can also then say, well, you know, you've got these kind of horrible traces here. It means you must have aggregation because what's happening then is that you've got big stuff just kind of diffusing into this, into that space where it's measuring. So um, again, you know, things like, um, you know, detergents, BSA, you know, you know, maybe, you know, do you have some DMSO in there, you know, change the pH, change the salt, that can actually uh, make things work. And you can do, again, a quick test to see, well, you know, is this going to give me a good signal window or not? So you can say, well, do I get a good change and reproducibly, you know, at saturation between three? Um, you know, if you get some scattery like this, well, it's not really going to work. Um, and it's relatively quick. Very easy to set up. Again, you can set it up in, 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 in four-wheel four -well plates. You just add, you know, the label material to a, a, a titration of the unlabeled material, one-to-one. -one. Make sure it's enough time. Check that you've got the, the fluorescence is okay. That, you know, across all the, the different capillaries, it's, it's looking pretty good. You know, when, you know, you get stuff like this, you're kind of going, well, do I know how to, to do I know how to, to use a pipette or not? Or is it the fact that you know something is going off? Um, you know, sometimes you may actually get a, a concentration dependence, and that's kind of maybe telling you something again. It could be that either you've got, you know, you're getting losses because the the labeled material itself is 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 a bit sticky, and when it forms a complex, then it's actually a bit more stable. Or it could be that, again, you're getting this proximity effect that you're getting a change in the fluorescence. So there's other ways to kind of check for that. Okay, so further info, um, obviously go to the biophysics internal website. There's lots of info in there about the different techniques. Um, there's links to different things. And then you can have a look at publications and see whatever other people have done. And of course, Shim's plug would be that um, we, we and Chris uh, and Arisa have, have um, edited a book on putting the uh, interactions is available in the library and also in the library as well. There should be the language book for all about fluorescence. And that is it. So any any questions? Thanks for your attention.